I'm Keith Spiro from NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. Welcome to Let's Talk. I am a television amateur, but my guest today is the consummate TV professional. In addition to her skills as a storyteller and journalist, she cares deeply about New Orleans, her hometown. She is also more stylish than I can ever aspire to be and an all-around cool person. She is the award-winning co-anchor of WWL-TV's Evening News, Sharice Gibson. Sharice, Hi. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Stylish. I like that. <laughs> this came with like a black t-shirt and jeans today. I mean, you <laughs> no know. No jewelry or anything. If I didn't have a wife and daughters, I would be here in a pair of shorts and a concert. <laughs> So they, whatever <laughs> shred of style I have is all because of them. Um, you know. Also because of New Orleans, the fact that it's humid and we just dress down and it's cool. We got to. <laughs> now, unlike uh, Katie Moore and yourself, your co-anchor, we did not color coordinate, but we no. still match, though. We still no, we don't. But see, the thing, people ask me recently, do you text each other and do you guys schedule, like, mm -hmm. colors? I always tell people there's so many colors in the rainbow, <laughs> and eventually at some point you have to wear the same colors because only certain colors look good on television. So you're going to go for reds and purples and greens. You know, sometimes when we wear patterns, mm -hmm. Devin Bartolotta and I recently wore patterns on air at the 10 o'clock show. And it, it looked like someone threw up colors all over <laughs> the set. It was so, it was like individually the dresses looked great. Together it looked like a monstrosity. <laughs> that was a distracting thing. And that's the things they teach you not to do. So I have like 20 red dresses and Katie is like, hundred red dresses and so that's just it ends up like that the odds are it's gonna yeah. land the wheels gonna land on those yeah. things right and sometimes Chris Franklin matches us and we all just kind of have our little thing going on it's like I think after working for it together for so long you're all kind of synced you just kind of know what well, seems like I mean and that's one of the things I think that makes your newscast work is that you have such a camaraderie it right. seems between you guys and it doesn't seem forced it seems very natural no it is you should see our group text <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Our, we, we actually talk about some of the craziest things, the, the, the best part in the evenings at 10 o'clock at the end of the show. We always come back on set uh, after break and, and we're in tears laughing about some conversation mm -hmm. that we were having during the break and it's usually Doug Mouton says something crazy and Chris chimes in and Devin <laughs> chimes in and everybody just kind of like, you know, we don't even hear the count back to the break, you know, come back to the show. So it's like five, four, three, two, one and everybody's like passed out like, oh, well, we're back on air. Uh, uh, good, good night, everybody, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, it's, but it's because it's a genuine friendship. We all hang out, we talk to each other, we've been to each other's houses for games and food and celebrate birthdays and give birthday cards and whatnot. It's a really great close relationship and you can't, for, you can't force that, you can't fake it. There was no better, I think, example of that than the, uh, the instance where you guys thought you were filming a little promo piece mm -hmm. and it ended up being a oh. reveal for Devin Bartolotta, uh, revealing that she was pregnant to you guys. Oh, Your reaction. my <laughs> God. <laughs> but, so that so I, I we just had this conversation about like my my gossip meter only goes so far. Uh -huh. So you know I don't speculate. I literally have so much on my mind that I'm not speculating about anything. So if I see someone puts on weight or they look different, I just figured they just you know they they had a couple of extra pool boys this weekend. So sure, you know happens. like because because I do the same thing. So <laughs> there is no speculation for me. So when when we did the promo, I know that with our company that happens, you know, you sure. have to do promos and and Dev and and and, and uh, Doug and I, we were just we thought it was normal. So what we thought it was weird like why is Devin like so we're sitting like this and like Oh, it's kind of weird for us to do a promo and Devin's like standing right there, but you know, whatever, maybe it's all audio. When she pulled out the onesie, I don't know if you saw it, took like a second for it to register what's happening. Right. And once I figured it out, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and my sister said, how did you not curse in that moment? Because usually your response right, is right. like, oh. <laughs> right, 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 right. I'm like, no, when you're on set, it just doesn't come out naturally. Right. So it, it just, she's, I'm so happy for her and, and she has, this baby girl that's on the way and, and in August they're gonna be out of here and she's gonna be raising that little thing and we, we've dubbed the baby Lil Lotta, Baby Lotta. Baby Lotta? Yeah, Lil Lotta. Lil Lotta. I Devin like Bartolotta, Lil Lotta. Lil Lotta. <laughs>
One of the best parts of that clip too was Doug Mouton's reaction. Doug didn't seem quite how to what to do. He kind of backed yeah. off and like it was like he oh. never knows what to do. <laughs> Doug, Doug, he's my favorite person in the world, by the way. Like we see each other. I to, to show how close we are. I give this man like the biggest bear hug every single day. I see him. Um, he is the funniest guy ever. He never knows what to do. Whenever something crazy is happening, his his reaction is to just back away and <laughs> walk off because he doesn't know what to do with his hands. Like that's that's Doug though. Like, but he's just a funny. And if you've been around Doug, especially if you've been to like any of the press club awards, you know that Doug is just a riot. Right. Like he's a lot. But one of my favorite human beings in the world. Love him to death. No, it, it, you know, that family vibe definitely comes through. And, and you know, you guys in the, the profession you're in, um, you know, you're public facing all the time. Right. So having that camaraderie with each other, um, knowing that everybody has your back, that's crucial to being able to do your job effectively, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. yeah, it is. And we cheer for each other all the time. Um, we All of us have had different accomplishments. Um, we've all done different really great stories and good work. Devin has done some great things. So is Katie. Chris, sometimes I'm like, he's a machine, you know, for Hurricane Ida. You, you, you have to imagine you're asking someone to talk for hours and hours on end about a storm as it slowly moves across the city or, you know, so they all do really amazing work. Doug Mouton puts a lot into his sports shows and we always say, you know that it's a first down Friday Doug because Doug will go completely just look like crazy you yeah. know and making sure that he puts on this a really amazing show so everybody's invested into the work and everyone is rooting for each other so you know we kind of give each other the space that we need and the support that we need so that we can keep moving you, no egos no egos can't no have egos. can't, have, can't, can't deal have with them. it um, no and you guys like I said I mean you, you know because you have to be public facing all the time right. you have to kind of uh, deal, you know, as you guys are dealing with things, hurricanes, what have you, on a personal level, you have mm. to be the pros that are out in front of the camera. Um, you know, I imagine the family, the, the Channel 4 family was very supportive. You went through a very tough thing a couple years ago with the loss of your brother. Yeah. They rallied around you, I would imagine, and oh, helped get goodness. you through that, uh, that, that process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the Channel 4, the community, the music community especially. Channel 4, I tell you this, I, when I found out I lost my little brother, it, that was the roughest moment because he was my baby. And and living, working in the French Quarter, I would get off of work at night and he was always playing at the Frenchman Street Bar. So it was yeah. like usually the BMC who still has his picture up in the bar to this day, mm. or he hung out at Cosmos. And so if you go into the bar at Cosmos, you'll see little stickers of his face everywhere and, and paintings of him as well. And, and it was difficult, you know, just kind of being, sure. being here because he was so, big in the music scene. When Terry passed away, I got so much support. When I walked inside of that funeral home for the Davis funeral, and we had his funeral at the Charbonnet Funeral Home on purpose because he was about music. Mm -hmm. And he, he was a trumpet player, and he played with all of the bands, and I wanted to have his funeral where, where, where jazz was born. And he needed, I said it needed to be in Treme. And I know that we didn't have the space, which is really funny because uh, we didn't tell Mr. Charmony how many people <laughs> knew him and how many people would be there because we walked in and we could barely get through the door. People were already in the hallway and the aisles and the chapel was full. And, and Glenn David Andrews, he, he sang so beautifully. Mm. Um, at the funeral, Sally and Robert showed up, and, and my co-anchor Katie was there, and Sheba Turk, you know, everyone was there in support, and Sheba had also recently lost her father. Mm. Um, but everyone was there in support, and I think the moment that I remember, they told me, take as much time as you need off. The moment I remember the day that I decided to come back to work, I walked into the newsroom, and this is at the height of the, not the height of the pandemic, but this is like we were just starting to ease our way back yep. into working from home. I walk into the newsroom and um, my executive producer, my senior executive producer, Lamar Bourgeois gets up and he just hug, does say a word, just gives me a big hug. And then like one by one, Keith Esperos, my news director at the time, right. walks out the office and he just, they literally just held me. Mm every single person that was in there. And basically, it was just them saying and reaffirming, I've got your back, we support you, take your time in doing this, 
and, and whatever you need, Keith was always checking in. You know, do you need time off? Are you doing, because I work too much. I know that. But, but <laughs> he's always asking if I need, if I needed to take a break. Do I need to, to take some time to just kind of separate myself from everything? Don't right. take on too much of a burden. But they supported me and continue to support me through this entire thing. In the music community, every time I'm out, Every, anywhere, walking the dogs in the garden district, if I'm kind of walking through the quarter, going into a show. I have so many musicians that come up and say, I knew Terry, I knew him well, we mm. played together, he played, he toured with us, or he, he used to fill in for me with the band, and every Frenchman Street bar and club owner knew him, and so it, it gives me a good feeling to know that they can share those memories, and sure. those stories of him being such a good person to them, and he was such a, he was full of life and full of energy, and and I love that that is his memory and that is his legacy. And we hope to do something with that legacy soon, but it was difficult for us for, you know, to lose someone unexpectedly, it really took a lot out of us. 20, it was 29, he was young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he, it was just before his 30th birthday. Mm. Well, so how did you know that you were ready to go back to work? Because obviously, I mean, you're on air, emotions right. come up, that's a, that's a tr tricky thing. How did oh. you know you were ready? I mean, oh, it was a hard year. It was a hard year. I, I think we're in year two uh, of his death. Mm -hmm. That first year was so difficult. Um, I don't ever think you're ever really ready. I think at some point, I guess, there was a moment where we were sitting after the funeral. So you go through all of the, the families in town and the houses full of people for like days on end. People are just there all the time and people are cooking for you. and you know, asking you what right. you need and they're taking care of you. Well, the funeral happens and everyone leaves. And I think that there was a moment where we were all sitting in the living room and everyone looked at each other and it was almost like, well, what do we do now? Like, so what do we do? Do you just, and then that was the question I still ask myself. You know, I, ha I got a therapist in which I always, I think people would do great learning meditation and therapy. Mm -hmm. But asking yourself, what do you do in that situation? Do you just move on and it's like, it didn't happen or do you just kind of how do you keep living I think that was my question I took some time off and it got to the point where I I felt like I was sulking and I was just home all the time and I wasn't doing anything and I said I need to do something to get myself going and I need to get myself move, moving yep. um, so I just eased my way back into work that was a few weeks later you know, it took some time because sure. at one point you feel like, especially if, like I said, you're not, someone's not sick, it's just an unexpected death, it, it hits you yeah. harder. It hits you harder, especially when it's your baby brother. And that's the first time that I lost someone who was like literally connected that close to me. So it took some time, but I needed to do something. I don't know what it is, but something needed to happen. So I, I thought going back to work was the first step because I knew I was walking into an environment that I had support, sure. that wasn't stressful, that I knew that if I needed to do, hey, I can only anchor these shows, I can't do all of the extra special reports, and you know, I, I knew that I was gonna get that support. So when you have that environment where it's, it's not as stressful as it is for a lot of other places, um, it made it easier to go back to. And I'm blessed in that, that I have that. I, I can't say the same for a lot of people who do what I do. Yeah. Yeah, no, because I mean, it could be cutthroat and right, right. competition yeah, and all that sort of thing, but you know, that family vibe. Well, and I, I think I'd read somewhere, you had said that before you came back to WDL, because you, you started there way, way back when, before you came back and took this job, you were thinking about getting out of the business? That, yes, yes. Which seems crazy, because as I said in the <laughs> intro, you seem perfectly suited for what you do. Yes. So what was the level of frustration uh, that had you thinking about getting out of the business? Look, I told, I told Keith, my news director, which I hope he sees this, I said, you know, people don't quit jobs, they quit people. <laughs> and, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I so I was talking, I was talking, you know, referencing his his retirement. And and um, you know, one of the reasons he I don't know if you realize this, but one of the reasons a lot of people came to work for WWL is they wanted the opportunity to work for Keith. Keith the Sparrows, you know? right. Yes. Right, well, right. you know, you would be great to work for too, but <laughs> well, funny you should say that. Because Keith the Sparrows, the new older news director, he told me more than once that he met somebody in a bar, introduced himself, and they started talking about music. Thinking oh, he was me. God. So yes, so, so there was some confusion. Oh there. my gosh. Well yeah. he's also a musician too. So exactly. Like, he plays bass. It gets very he, confusing. He can he can play along with that. But no, I, I was I I was frustrated, you know, we were, I was not given the creative space mm -hmm. um, that I'm being given now, the opportunity to express myself through my work. 
um, I was tired of, I was doing morning shows, so I was tired of the 2 a.m. wake up and oh. tried to, you know, I wasn't falling asleep till midnight, so I was waking Ooh. up at 2 in the morning, and then it's like, you gotta Ow. be on air, you, gotta, you have to be on air at 4.30 in the morning, <sighs> and you were doing so much work, and you weren't getting any extra support, and it got to the point where I felt like this just didn't matter anymore. Yeah. Nobody's listening. Um, nobody is listening to what I have to say. This doesn't matter anymore. I'm working like crazy just to kind of like, and it, you get tired and you burn yourself out. You're not getting the support that you need. And so I said, you know what, after this, whatever next job I get, this is probably going to be the last one. I'm, and I was in my mind, I'm, I'm not a person that acts on impulse. Mm -hmm. If I've done something, I completely thought about it like for okay. a, a while. Okay. So I, I, um, I was going to find another job. And when I got the other job, I was like, this is, okay, this is a three-year contract I'm going to sign. This is my three years to, to work my way out of it because I just gotten tired of it. The yeah. industry was going through a period where they were, a lot of journalists weren't getting support, especially black journalists. You had a lot of black journalists who were going through a lot and they were witnessing a lot and we needed to be more honest about what was happening and I was in a space where I was in the station before this where I was not given the freedom to have that honesty mm -hmm. and I, I, I had some negative encounters. I was also the president of the Greater Cincinnati Association of Black Journalists so um, in working there I was advocating for black journalists there as well. So um, that led to some conflict, actually, mm. uh, within my own station at the time. Um, so I was in HR a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it's, it's, it's interesting, because someone like me wouldn't do anything ridiculous at work, but um, it was just, I just got tired of it. I was just done with it. And then I got here, which I didn't expect to get here. I had another interview uh -huh. um, in <laughs> Minneapolis, Minnesota, oh, wow. which I said is absolutely nuts for me because you're talking about what one of the coldest places in America. Yeah. When New Orleans gets down to like 60, I'm freezing. Sure. Like sure. I, I'm complaining. I'm freezing. Absolutely. I cannot believe it's so cold. Like I, <laughs> how? What was I gonna do in Minneapolis? Minneapolis. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Paris the thought. Oh. Well, you, you get here, though, and you have been given, it seems like, the freedom oh, yeah. to do these projects. And, you know, in the, the 10 minutes we have left here, I want to hit on some of those projects yeah. that you've done. Um, you know, first off, I have to mention the talk, uh, which is a series you did about uh, how black parents talk to their kids about how to essentially be safe in America. And just the, the existence of that project, to me, speaks to the importance of having diverse points of view in a newsroom because had someone said to me oh we're going to do something about the talk right. i would have said oh the sex talk is that what we're talking about like, <laughs> I, you know which comes i don't even know if we had i had that in my household i can't yeah figure it out. i mean i figured it out but uh yeah, yeah so so yes yeah, so the fact mine that, was don't have sex that was it <laughs> that, that was the talk done so but no but the, the the fact that you know there, there's a segment of the population that may not even be aware that these sorts mm. of conversations are happening so that's why i think it's very important to have like i said these different yeah. points of view in a newsroom so you have these possibilities and and support in a newsroom so what I what I cherish so much about Channel 4 is the support that you get not just from Keith I don't know if people know about the general manager Todd Smith he <laughs> is fantastic and and those conversations the talk was birthed out of a conversation that they initially had about this in the height of the Black Lives Matter movement um, and this was the first time the talk was the very first time where I wanted where I was allowed basically to to let people tell their truths and express themselves and that's why if you listen to it I, I took myself out of it I actually wasn't in it at all um, I didn't want to write any track I didn't want to mm -hmm. kind of tell a story I'm like I want people to express and tell their own stories and how they feel and so I was behind the camera and I wanted to kind of put a lens on different people in our communities. We have people who are artists that were a part of it, who were fathers, who were lawyers, attorneys, mm -hmm. educators, yeah. activists. We came, we wanted different walks of life just to show that even though people are on different walks and different paths, they all have the same experience. And and I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I did not know it would get the reception that it got. Mm. And, and the talk birthed several other projects after, um, and, and now it's birthed the project that I'm working on currently, Follow the Line. Um, and that was actually something that I, Follow the Line, I started shooting 
two years ago. Mm. Um, so I look like different people on every ep <laughs> like every single episode. I look like a different person because I shot it in the midst of the pandemic. Yeah. All of the interviews are outside, um, and I have like I had an afro, and so I would like I had like all my hair combed back and like a little beehive yeah. cap thing because all of the hair salons are closed. So I don't know right, what to do. Right, right. So, um, so but we stopped. We shot it two years ago. And we stopped because the week that we were supposed to continue our interviews and start editing and writing, that was the week that my brother passed away. Mm. So when he passed away that week, I could not write for about a year. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, I, sure. I had a hard time. And it was hard because it was the worst and best year of my life because that year he passed away, that is also the same year that I found out I won my first national morrow and so it's like it's hard to celebrate because you're going to New York and, and just a few months later you're in New York and you're, you're celebrating this huge win and have the CEO of the company and vice president go calling to congratulate you. And it's kind of a surreal moment because you want to be extremely excited about it, but you're still miserable because, you know, inside you can't call your brother or on a family group chat it's like you know there's a mom and my dad and my sister and my brother right. but my brother's not responding you right. know it's those little things that that bother you but those projects are the reason I'm given that creative freedom is one of the reasons why I continue to do the work that I do here to be able to tell those stories they're very important and we have so many stories in the city that that need to be told that kind of fly under their radar well they're important because it gets to the, the, the root causes of some of the issues that we have now. And yes. it's, it's very easy to kind of gloss over the surface uh, and talk about what's happening, but to understand why things are the way they are. There yeah. are reasons, and so that's what that's the importance, especially of the, the follow the line story. I think is, is I'm, I'm so glad you said that, because I get a lot of flack for follow the line. I've gotten some, I got someone who wrote a really nasty long email to me about it. And they think that in bringing these topics up that you're trying to further increase the divide. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. Follow the line was done so that we can show people that the divide was created in the first place. And it wasn't created by, you know, just us wanting to be separated from each other. There were, thi there were things that were put in place that pushed certain people to one community and certain people to another community. There were influences, there were different policies put in place, you know, that segregation was built in yeah. and we just continued on with it. So, so I wanted to give the origin story of the city to show that, you know, this is an issue that goes far, first of all, before redlining given came about. You know, now we have all of these policies that were put in place, racial zoning laws and, you know, being uh, having restrictive covenants and all of these things were meant to segregate us. And it is one of the reasons why most of America to this day, most urban cities are still very much segregated. But the next iteration of Follow the Line, the next three parts, which I have many other parts to work on, <laughs> so it's not done yet. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talk about the consequences of that segregation because there are consequences. You know, just for instance, COVID-19 pandemic, there was a, there are studies that show a correlation between the people who died and particular communities that were redlined versus those that weren't redlined. Mm. You know, I don't know if you've heard that saying, you know, your life expectancy sometimes depends on your zip code. Zip code, sure. So, okay, why is that happening? Because we were pushed to particular zip codes and certain communities were invested in and certain communities were divested from, so. Well, and it's the same issue of why petrochemical plants are built in areas right. uh, that, you know, have less resources in poor areas. I mean, it's, it's you right. know, that's, there's a correlation and, between those sorts of things. And that's another issue that I'm passionate about writing about because when you go to those places like in St. John, first of all, you know, just driving up River Road, it, it's just the the cane. It's beautiful. You kind of, kind of. I sometimes ride up there by myself and in silence with the windows down, and you just kind of take a look back at what this place likely used to be. Yeah. And it's a moving moment. And when you meet some of the people there, my family from my mom's side, they're from Tangibahoe Parish. So they're all in Amy, Louisiana, still to this day. Mm -hmm. So when you talk to them, it's like these people are like. They're, they sound like my family, you know? They don't, they don't know much about what's happening, and sometimes I have to speak for my grandmother, so when I speak sometimes about their issues and problems, I feel like I'm, I'm, like I'm speaking for my own family. It hits home, it hits home, it yeah. hits home. 
talk about, uh, we only got a couple minutes left here, but you, you talked about the emails and feedback you get. Uh, I remember yeah. when your, the Africa pendant caused oh, a bit of a thing, which. Africa pendant. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> crazy on a number of levels, uh, yeah. not the least of which is the fact that if you go back far enough, mm -hmm. everybody came out of Africa. I mean, right, you, go right. back, you just gotta go back, you know, a lot longer for some people, folks than others, but I mean, you we, know, we all. We have a joke in the newsroom. I, I found out in my ancestry, I have like, four or five percent Irish or something or eight percent so I said you know will they get upset if I came out with the, uh, <laughs> with, with an Irish pendant or you know something like that but you know honestly that that's unfortunate it was an unfortunate situation but it's it's you get a lot of emails from people who have whatever personal beefs or problems they have with you um, or with uh, what they think what you do represents you know some people don't like me because of the stories I tell because sure. they think I'm very divisive when that's not the case whatsoever. I love everyone and, and I'm always just trying to share the truth as to what is happening in our city and what's happening in our community so we can come to some greater understanding and bridge the gaps that need to be bridged because there are two different New Orleans. There's the New Orleans that I've experienced and sometimes there's the New Orleans that someone else has experienced. Um, like I say, Mardi Gras Day, some people do St. Charles, some people are under the bridge on Claiborne. But, um, but yeah, that was unfortunate. But you know, to be honest with you, like, didn't really care. Like, I just kind of got to keep doing my thing, and I can do that with the support of management, and I still have it. So, sorry. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you keep telling those stories because they are very important, and it's important for both sides of New Orleans and all sides and all people in the oh, city yeah. to understand one another and know where they're coming from. Yeah. So um, I hope everybody so. benefits from it. To be honest with you, it's not just for me. It's I love this place. This is my home. And, and I think we do better when we know more about us and what happened and where we come from, all of us. Um, and I hope to expand the series to talk a lot. I'm, I'm very curious about Irish Channel. I'm very curious about how the Italians arrived in New Orleans, you know? So, you know, I have a lot more in the works. Just, just wait for me. <laughs> Just give me a second. One person. <laughs> All right. Well, we will do that. Sharice, this has been great. I mean, we could have talked for another two hours here. But oh, this we is sure? Really we good. don't have time. <laughs> we can push it back. Oh, my we gosh. Do more. Oh, my gosh. No. I'm starting now. I've got a latte. I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. This is really, I, you know, again, you're a natural for this. I hope Thanks. you keep telling these stories for a long time. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much All for having right. me. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching. I'm Keith Spira, and I'll see you next time on Let's Talk.